Shortly after the turn of the 20th century, Reverend George Shipman Payson delivered a final sermon inside a wood frame country chapel in northern Manhattan. It was the end of his four decade long ministry, one that the retiring preacher ruefully regarded as 40 years in the wilderness. The congregation of the Mount Washington Presbyterian Church resided on Manhattan's northern tip in a neighborhood called Inwood an area north of Washington Heights that roughly spans the Dykeman Valley floor near West 192nd Street, north to the Spite and Dival. We lived ten miles from a beefsteak, Payson recalled. Table supplies had to be ordered the day before they were needed. The nearest livery stable was three miles away, and there were no telephones. If poorer roads existed on the continent, they were not within the limits of Manhattan Island. Payson's grim recollections came at a critical moment in the region's development, just as Inwood was making the transition from farm to city. And while a modern reading of Payson's time-worn memories certainly conjures up a lost Inwood, the neighborhood's early history stretches back much further to a distant, prehistoric time when mastodons roamed a primeval uptown. About 17,000 years ago, northern Manhattan and much of New York City was encased in glacial ice. Evidence of the ice sheet's retreat is today visible in Inwood Hill Park, where smooth, bowl-shaped glacial potholes eroded by swirling meltwater can be explored trailside. As forests returned, giant mammals, including mastodons, foraged amid lush vegetation, leaving behind teeth and tusks. Humans arrived as well. Explorer Hendrick Hudson sailed into New York Harbor in 1609 and journeyed up the North River possibly encountering the Lenape, who lived near Spite and Dival. Before long, the Dutch West India Company established a trading post at the foot of New Amsterdam, and Dutch immigrants began to arrive, eventually displacing the Lenape. By the 1670s, the land at the top of Manhattan had been claimed by two of these settlers. The new landowners, Jan Dijkman and Jan Nagel, then engaged a tenant farmer to improve the property for the unusual price of one hen per year. For much of the American Revolution, during British occupation of the region, 1776 to 1783, the Dykemans endured a self-imposed exile outside Inwood. Some served as guides for American marauding parties as the conflict dragged on. During these bloody years, large numbers of British soldiers and Hessian mercenaries lived in crude, improvised huts throughout the region. To treat us from their entrenchments include musket balls, uniform buttons, broken bottles, and other cast-offs of daily life. Landowners returned when the fighting ceased, and the neighborhood relaxed back into its former sleepy agrarian existence. Only occasionally, perhaps upon finding an arrowhead or musket ball in a field or garden, did the past intrude upon the present. Memories of New York's history as a slave state faded after the emancipation laws brought slavery to a legal end in 1827. A former slave cemetery on 10th Avenue was all but forgotten. Early 19th century residents rallied to create an educational system in a region where none existed. In 1818, Elizabeth Hamilton and Jacobus Dykeman founded the one-room Hamilton Free School near today's intersection of Broadway and West 189th Street. The school provided free education to its young charges. Public School 52 later opened on Academy Street in 1858. The community also established a lending library decades before comparable city services arrived. In the 1840s, a train depot opened at Tubby Hook on the Hudson River, and the neighborhood's first commuter architect, Samuel Thompson, arrived. Thompson built an airy mansion atop Inwood Hill, as well as Reverend Payson's church near Dykeman Street and Broadway. Practically overnight, a town sprang up. For several decades, Inwood became a fashionable destination where the downtown merchant class built lavish weekend retreats. Soon, Brooks' brother Elijah Brooks, retail titan James McCreary, Puck Magazine publisher Joseph Kepler, and Isidore Strauss of Macy's all had places atop the hill. When the railroad inexplicably changed the name of the Tubby Hook Station to Inwood in 1864, the name stuck. 
In 1871, the good times came to a full stop when train service was sharply reduced. The already remote region became nearly inaccessible when trains were rerouted to the Bronx side of the Harlem River. Without the railroad, Inwood was once again an isolated backwater. The merchant class abandoned their properties. The Dykeman family moved out of their farmhouse. Dickensian institutions began to populate Inwood Hill. A tuberculosis sanitarium, a home for unwed mothers, and a house of mercy for women whose behavior deviated from Victorian norms. Inwood Hill became a dumping ground for society's outcasts. The sale of hundreds of acres of Dykeman land in four auctions beginning in 1868 spurred real estate speculation. By the 1890s, streetcars arrived atop Fort George, and road improvements were gathering momentum. Ideas for development came and went. A change was in the air. During this time, an unlikely pair of self-taught archaeologists, Reginald Pelham Bolton and William Calver, engineers by day, uncovered remarkable relics related to the native Lenape people and the American Revolution. Using simple metal rods called sounders, the lifelong friends carefully probed loose soil disturbed by work crews. The entire neighborhood was, after all, under construction. The noisy and chaotic landscape proved a fertile hunting ground for the Victorian duo. The pair unearthed a stunning piece of Lenape pottery on West 214th Street near 10th Avenue in 1906, embedded in the soil of a freshly cut embankment. Arrowheads, stone blades, and even cave-like shelters in Inwood Hill rounded out the remarkable tale of Inwood's distant past. Similar digs on the Dykeman Farm, the largest and oldest of the region's former Dutch Boweries, unearthed countless relics from the American Revolution. Then, suddenly, the city arrived. The completion of an elevated subway line in 1906 and later, the A train in the 1920s, precipitated a residential building boom. Parks arrived with the dedication of Isham Park in 1912 and Inwood Hill Park in 1926. The first neighborhood apartment buildings were erected near the corner of Dykeman Street and Broadway around 1904. Dozens more were finished by the end of the decade. By 1940, little land remained undeveloped. Soon the neighborhood was filled with new residents attracted by low rents and developers' promises of clean air and country living. Many newcomers came from Germany and Ireland. New Yorkers, Swedes, Poles, and even an enclave of Japanese rounded out the mix. By the 1960s, many within these early groups had moved to suburbia. Newcomers, particularly immigrants from the Dominican Republic, quickly filled the void. Musicians, artists, actors, and writers were also attracted by lower rents and convenient access to downtown. Today, Inwood, the little backwoods village Reverend Payson once described as nestled in a pocket between two great rivers beyond which it could not expand, faces a new population boom as updated zoning laws take effect. What will life be like for Inwood residents in 10, 50, or 100 years? Whatever the future brings, we hope this book will help readers remember Inwood's past, from the Ice Ages to the present day.